a very warm welcome to this Ray Worth's Harrogate Literature Festival as part of the Harrogate International Festivals. It's very generously sponsored by a local solicitors firm, Ray Worth's LLP Solicitors, and we're particularly grateful to them this year of all years for obvious reasons. We're grateful to you as well for turning up and watching this. If you do feel like donating to the festival, you can go to their website. My name is Matt Sladden. I'm a broadcaster. I'm a producer, I'm a writer, I'm even a, a nature photographer as well. And I'm more than excited to introduce to you a man who very rarely for me has actually interviewed me more times than I've interviewed him. <laughs> Jeremy, I think this is the second time I've interviewed you, but you've interviewed me, can you believe it, four times. And what I love is we've done, we've done so many different subjects. So, and I don't even know if we could sort of connect them together. I know we talked about anxiety once, we talked about birds. We've probably talked about photography, and I definitely have talked to you about poetry and the joy of that Lady of Shalott poem. So you're a man of, of many, what is the phrase? You've got many arrows in your quiver. Well, <laughs> thank you, Jeremy, as have you, of course. We have to be careful that this doesn't deteriorate into a mutual admiration. No, you could, no, exactly, yeah, we must stop. But the real reason we're here, actually, is because you've written another book, and it's called The Diver and the lover and it's set in early 1950s spain so that's franco spain and it's about love it's about obsession it's almost about the art of obsession and it hangs on a picture that you particularly love in glasgow doesn't it it does now it's it's a love story fundamentally so that that part of it i would i would always lead off on it's about two sisters very different different mums same father arrive in spain from hull they're traveling it turns out because the oldest sister meredith has been deeply traumatized by events in her childhood and has been in a as it would have been called a lunatic asylum and her younger very exuberant very feisty sister Ginny, who's only 18 is sort of trying to get her better and they're drawn through Meredith's love of, of surreal art, because as the person who was insane, the only thing she understands is the art of the surreal, which of course, sane people can't understand, the thought goes. And she goes, she takes them both, she leads them both to Cadaques in Spain, which is where Dali, Salvador Dali was hanging out at that time. But, but I suppose what, what I'm driving towards is the painting of a particular picture, which you, you mentioned, which I, I have become a bit obsessed with. It hangs in the Kelvin Grove. Do you know the one I'm talking about? I do, I looked it up before doing this. It's spectacular. It's, it, it, it's, it's a religious painting. And, and Dali, I think, had someone posing for him by hanging off something. Correct. So when the first time I saw it, and I'm not a big arty painting person, but basically I was doing eggheads. Um, we were filming 65, 66 editions in a fortnight, so it's quite knackering. And one of the questions was, who invented the lobster telephone? And I didn't know, and they said, as they always do, they always get the answer. They said Salvador Dali. And I said, oh, he's quite an interesting artist. I mean, because I always remembered those really weird, surreal scenes like the melting clocks, or the burning giraffe, or the knuckles becoming uh, rocks, or the swans turning into elephants on the pond, you know. And they said, oh no, but the, the, this really famous painting round the corner from our studio here in Glasgow, they said, is called Christ of St. John of the Cross, and you should go and see it. So on this very precious day off in our crazy filming schedule, I did go to the gallery, the Kelvin Grove, which I love, by the way. I've seen it, I think, now 15, 20 times since then. And I just stood in front of it. And I wouldn't, in a funny way, it's not a religious painting, it's a sacrilegious painting, because what Dali's done is he's, he's given you the, the crucifixion of Christ from a blasphemous angle. It's, shall I tell you the context here? It's, yes. it's based on a sketch by a monk called Juan or St. John of the Cross in 1570. And this monk was a bit of a kind of motorhead style monk. He wanted things to be a, a lot tougher. He, he wanted people to uh, go shoeless, discalced was the word. He wanted them to go fasting, etc. He got in the end into trouble because he did this tiny sketch, no bigger than a post-it note, of Jesus on the cross from above. And at that time, 1570, you were not allowed to, to have the same view of Christ that God did. So Dali takes that picture of St. John of the Cross and he turns it into the Christ of St. John of the Cross and he paints this scene. But, you know, so that, that's where, I mean, that was the striking image that I saw, almost as if you imagine you're being catapulted from outer space towards Earth and the first thing you see is the top of the head of Jesus Christ. That's the image. But what was really interesting to me, Matt, was that when I turned, just caught a turn and looked at the gallery wall, there's this little card 
been expanded now, actually, but it was the size of a playing card, which said that this was posed by the stuntman, Russell Saunders, who was hung from a gantry in the ceiling of the artist's studio. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's incredible. But like you, I, I kind of remember, Darley, when I was looking at his artwork, mostly as a boy, because I, I wasn't a massive fan. There's these strange contortions and stuff. But looking at this image, it's rather beautiful in, in, a, in an odd way. Oh, it's incredible. And of course, what the, in, the, in the olden days, the great modern artists, the, 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 the ones who were in the vanguard, like Picasso, like Dali, fundamentally, they had all those basic artistic skills of being able to paint and sketch sinew and muscles and veins. And, and yeah, I mean, if you look at the painting and you just take it, take it as you find it, you notice a number of strange things. There are no nails in the hands or the feet. Obviously, the angle we've mentioned is extremely strange. It's got a harrowing perspective where Christ's head and shoulders are enormous. And then it almost the cross then points down towards the earth, which seems to be, you know, almost, you're almost on the edge of space when you're looking at it. Um, there's a blank piece of paper at the top where the, the inscription King of the Jews was. So that's, that's not there. The funny thing as well is he's got a very modern hairstyle which was the artist's hair. Now in my obsession, sorry, sorry, the stuntman's hair, in my slight obsession with the guy who, who posed it, who was, who was famous without being known. That was the interesting thing about celebrity back in the day. If you're a Hollywood stuntman, your name and your face might be known, but no one knew much about what made him tick. He never had married or had kids. He doesn't have that many relatives around. So I began looking into this guy and I found a picture of him doing a handstand on Muscle Beach in the 1930s with exactly the sort of body shape that you have in that painting. And I just thought, what, what went through Russell Saunders' mind when he, as a stuntman who wouldn't have known much about Dali, was asked to pose this thing? And my book really, essentially that the engine for the plot is that he walks out. And he walks out and Dali needs to find another person, a replacement. And he goes for a very muscular young waiter, that's the dival, diver in the title of the book, uh, in a local hotel. And my heroine is in love with the diver, and that's why it's the diver and the lover. And you know something very bad is gonna happen on that cross. It's refreshing, and I'm gonna be very careful not to be overly sick of fancy, but it is perhaps a little unusual for a man so embedded in current affairs as you are to have such a hinterland. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know about that because I've always felt when I've been, and maybe it's because I, I joined the BBC in 1987 or was it 1887? So, so, you know, so long ago. I mean, literally the people in reception wore peak caps on the days, the day I went in. We didn't have 24 hour news. We didn't have the internet. We had manual typewriters, etc. And so I feel that the people around me and the people I, I saw who were on the road, the reporters and the people I, I suppose the people I wanted to be, were all where they were because they were three dimensional. And, and it's only recently we've ended up with people who are on television because they don't, they don't have a third dimension. They, are, they exist in two dimensions in real life as well. So I, that's very kind of you to say that. I mean, I think in the end for me, life's about words. I'm a word-based person. I don't understand Instagram. I don't understand how you communicate just by sending people photos of things. So this, I, I always spot true. you right. This isn't true, Joe. I've sat in your Radio 2 studio with you promoting my bird book, which by the way, is just over there, over my shoulder. Excellent, and, and I love it. Like videoing away, I think almost as we were live, you were doing some sort of live streaming on Twitter. So you know all about the visuals and you've been a man who's been embedded in TV as well as radio. That's true. No, I, I'm happy with the, I, the medium. It's just that I can't understand the, the Instagram thing is you simply communicate only with a picture. That, that threw me. And I think fundamentally some of us are words based. I'll give you an example. My favorite artist is Elvis Costello. And that has to be because of the incredible power of his words. I was listening to his second album the other day. There's a song in it called Little Triggers. And it goes, little triggers that you pull with your tongue. And then I read Middlemarch and there's the phrase again, little triggers that you pull with your tongue. And I thought, oh my goodness, this guy who was pretending to be a punk in 1977 was actually lifting lines from, what was it, George Eliot? Isn't that incredible? I've got to ask you a little bit about your music. I mean, there's so many different jumping off points and I'm already skipping over questions that I want to ask you. So I'll try to come back to them. But I'm not so familiar with Elvis Costello. I remember I was interviewing a lot at the Salisbury International Arts Festival a few years ago and he was headlining there. And I wasn't blown away by him, but you're not always blown away by the greats in performance. I remember going to Dylan back in the early 2000s and he just played his new music, new music at the time. And I wasn't very excited about it, but I interviewed someone just the other day who was a Dylan expert, a professor from 
Barclay in the States, and he just brought the music alive for me again. And it reminded me how much I love Bob Dylan, but not quite as much as Paul Simon and Leonard Cohen. Apart from Costello, who do you really love? Uh, well, I mean, the Keith, it's like asking when were you 17, isn't it? So you go to 1982 and you ask what's around. I was a little bit precocious as a music lover when I was a teenager. So I got into really good stuff really early. And I know it's good now because the key band I was into, Joy Division, are now recognised as one of the greatest bands of all time, no question. They only put out two albums and then very sadly the lead singer took his own life. So I would say Joy Division, New Order for that doomy gloomy thing. And then I'd go obviously Smiths because the Smiths were in power in the three years that I was at university. So you had that incredible bed sit angst was their whole thing of here's the guy. The very first term I was at Durham University, somebody gave me a ticket to see the Smiths. I hadn't even heard of them. And Morrissey came on the stage on one foot with some flowers in his back pocket and a hearing aid in and national health glasses. And I just was blown away. That was incredible. But yeah, I mean, clearly Dylan is amazing. And David Letterman famously said, to his son the other day, because he told this story, he said, you don't have to remember me, but I want you to remember that Bob Dylan was the greatest songwriter who ever lived. And I, and I sort of buy that, but I think with Dylan, you had to be there. I've always, I know Van Morrison is at that level and I can't quite get it and I want to, and I've tried and I love him, don't get me wrong, but I know he's at a really spiritual level. Um, but I think, where are we with that? Where am I now? What am I listening to? I mean, I just love, I love it all. I just, what I don't like is the real pop pap, I think, you know, and I, the stuff that is only just there to go up the charts. You, know. you yourself, Jeremy, were in a band with your brother, Tim, the, the, the great one-liner, the great man of the one-liners, brilliant a comedian, someone I've interviewed and liked enormously myself, but you and he were in a band together when you were much, much younger. And it yes. was described, correct me if I'm wrong, by Smash, Smash Hits magazine. That's the most unfashionable punk band in the country. Well, I think it was even worse. I think it was the most unfashionable punk band in Cheam, which is even worse. <laughs> but yeah, we, we had, actually, do you know what? It was, a, it was a very interesting insight into how news works because we'd all been in bands. Tim was a great writer of songs and played guitar. I played the drums. My friend Simon Williams played guitar. You know, and we, we wanted to be the jam and we wanted to be the police and we would play and practice for hours and we could get nowhere. And then we just thought, okay, let's just do something that's exactly the reverse of everything. So we're not gonna be cool and grumpy. We're gonna be really friendly and it's so great and we're wearing university sweatshirts without realizing how stupid and how uncool and wearing very, very flared trousers in an era of drain pipes. And it was just instant. We were in the papers, we were in the Sun newspaper, we were on Radio One, we were in Smash Hits. It didn't make any sense. And you just realize that that's the classic news narrative, isn't it? That it is, it is Man Bites Dog. It's, it was the reverse. But you know, of course it goes nowhere. That's the trouble. So there's no quality there. So, um, but it was very funny and yeah, it was our band and we did a few gigs. We couldn't really play, but my brother wrote quite good songs, but there were only three of us. And uh, yeah, it was, it didn't really end well, if I'm honest. It was wasn't, it wasn't gay. Was it your dream though? I mean, was it a serious? Oh yeah, of course. Talked, I mean, I don't think anybody, you talked to everybody Alan wants to be Elvis. Where if you're my age, you're born in 1965, you obviously want to either be John Lennon or Elvis or whatever. I mean, there's no question. I remember the first really, the big switch on moment for me was 1976. I heard watching The Detectives by Elvis Costello. I was 11 and it was like, for me, it was like watching a film. You know, she's filing her nails while they're dragging the lake. What a line. And I just thought, this is incredible. So you want to kind of model that. And I think the way you model, you know, I look at Robin Day and I want to be Robin Day or David Dimbleby or whatever. That's how we get inspired. Kenny Everett's an example. So yes, of course we all want to be Elvis. That's very interesting you say about modeling on other people because there are those who say you absolutely have to be yourself. You can't, you can't I'm not suggesting for a second you do, but you can't lie in terms of who you are if you're a really good presenter. Um, it's, it's, you will always start by, by, I think, kind of trying to create yourself out of somebody else. To give you an example, the, probably the greatest reporter, although remind me never to say this to Michael Burke again, was Martin Bell, the BBC, right? And he had a particular staccato style, you know. Um, they say there are no straight paths to peace. That's what that's his stuff. The wake-up call came from the barrel of a gun. 
So when I started as a news trainee in 1987 and I went to Belfast and the very first television piece I had to do was something about a school protest. My first line was, um, they, they came with banners and marched down the school drive. And I literally delivered it like that. And then over time, you maybe fi hopefully find your own voice. But then somebody said to me, God, in the 80s, uh, on, in the BBC, on the 90s, all the trainees wanted to be Paxman. And they would all sit around and say, why are you telling us this? You know, and so I suppose that's the way it goes. And of course, now we see the danger of this modeling thing, because what happens is that I had a model, I had Robin Day, right? And, and then the next ones had Paxman. But if you're a young working class, BAME teenager, you don't have a, you have a model there. So you can't see a way there. And I think it's, it, it, it blocks off the road for people, actually. I think that's a really interesting point. I have to admit, I've, I've fit the cliche, I wanted to be Paxman. He was the man that you, my great uncle actually, on my father's side, trained him a year, many, many years ago. But I, 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 I What was his name? Was he a BBC person then? He was, but it was before your time, Eric Stadlin. And he, he kind of was like one of the editors, I think, of the PM programme. And then he did the training. He trained Hugh Edwards and all sorts of people, I think. Maybe not Hugh. Anyway, Paxman was someone I wanted to be, even though I thought sometimes he was a bit hard on people who didn't quite deserve it. I mean, it's one thing for go going for a politician, but another going for anybody. Maybe, maybe that's an unfair characterization, but you well, it's, him. You I was going to say, it's, it's, it's very funny you mentioned him, or I mentioned him first, but, but I had this bizarre thing where um, I, when I was at Westminster, which was the 90s, I, I, this, I was worked nonstop. So one night I was alone in the office doing the late shift, and the job was to basically look at the papers and you file for the morning bulletins. And I had Newsnight on, and of course in those days no internet, so you couldn't rewind and stuff, but I became aware something was going on with Paxman and Michael Howard, right? And it seemed like he'd asked him the same question many times. Did you threaten to overrule him? Did you threaten to overrule him? So after about half a dozen, I start counting, right? And I get up to 14. And, and, I, and I got no other stories, so I file this into the system, and then it blows up on the morning bulletin, you know, that Michael Howard was asked the same question 14 times by Jeremy Paxman did. And so and there was a guy involved called Derek Lewis, and it was all a bit technical. But basically, the whole thing went completely mad. And, and I watched this, and then, I, then, of course, all the papers reported it. Lewis, Lewis it was the chief, chief inspector of prisons, wasn't he, at the time? Derek Lewis, yeah, correct. And, he, and, and the question was, was he in operational control, or was Michael Howard? And, the, and if Michael Howard threatened to overrule him, that meant Michael Howard was in charge. So it was a really good question. That's the thing. No one ever remembers the question, why the question was asked. But, but anyway, I saw this, this story about Michael, Jeremy Paxton asked the same question 14 times, go everywhere, right? So I, I assumed, as you would, that because it's now, as Paxton said to me once, that's what's on my tombstone, I assumed that someone else had counted it. But it turned out that only I had counted it. And now when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Why would anyone else bother, right? I had to interview Paxman a couple of years ago for the Apple Door Book Festival. And um, he, so I read his book and this passage comes up. Now at this time, we've never had a conversation about it. And in fact, I've almost forgotten myself that it was me who, who filed it. And it says, um, uh, it then appeared on the news that I asked uh, Michael Howard the same question 14 times. I came into the office the next day and I played the tape back. So he obviously got the video out. And it wasn't 14, it was 11. Um, but, but why would I ever expect a correction from my own organisation? So it was something a bit, he was a bit disgruntled. So, so it's your interview, fault. Your fault. Yeah. So in the interview, I say to him, and then you said it wasn't even 14. You said, this will be on my gravestone no matter what I do in my life, he says. And it wasn't even 14. So he's obviously cross about it. So I said, gosh, that's terrible. Some reporter got it wrong. And he said, there's no use looking so pleased with yourself. I know it was you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is brilliant. This is you, you had stood in for him over the summers, hadn't you, for a couple of years before you then became a fully fledged Newsnight presenter yourself. I, I want to come to Newsnight first, but we're jumping around. And I want to go back a little bit earlier. So, sure. you were born or brought up in Epsom in Surrey. Yeah. You had a sister and you had your brother Tim, as we've already mentioned. You went to Durham University. You, you got yourself a 2 2. Yes. Did you want to get a better degree than that, Jeremy? I did, and I, and I was gutted about it for a while, but to be honest, I hadn't done any work, and I think that is mitigation. What did I, you study? I, I, well, I can't even remember. I think technically it was English literature, but basically I spent my whole time working on the student newspaper and yeah, sort of wheeler dealing a bit. So I realised early on that I had to get involved in the local radio station. I went to BBC Radio Newcastle, and I couldn't get arrested there. You know, I mean, there was literally, I couldn't get into reception. 
Then I went to Metro Radio, which was the commercial one, and a lovely guy called Giles Squire, who um, bizarrely wrote the song Step Right Back, or you got to step right back to where you started from. He wrote that irrelevant. Anyway, he was on the station and he said, yeah, funny enough, once a week, we do need someone to do the overnights. So I ended up doing two till five in the morning, but of course then I was knackered the next day. So I, I, I was clear even then that there's priorities thing and I've got to decide, am I going to be serious about putting some stuff on my CV for media or am I going to try and get a better degree? And I, I made the, I guess the wrong choice because now I'm being reminded about my two, two. <laughs> you, you edited the, the student newspaper there, didn't you? And as well as that, that's words, or largely words, photos too, of course. But I think I'm right in saying that you were part of the comedy sketch show as well. And yes, there are lots of words in what you do, but you're a performer as well. I mean, you wouldn't have taken over the swingometer from Peter Snow otherwise. Uh, well, that's true. Peter Snow is my broadcast hero because he has two things. The two qualities you need in broadcasting, I think, are enthusiasm and expertise. And, and it's very rare to get them together. And I, and I love Snowy for that reason. He really showed me what, what it's all about. You know, it's a great honor to do the swingometer. So, yeah, and, and you see from my brother or my sister, who's a, an actress as well as a painter, there's obviously some sort of performance gene. And I'm always trying to think, what is it? Where does it come from? And it might be my dear old dad, who died a couple of years ago, who I once showed him around the BBC. And, and he, we came into the studio, it was a big plinth. And it was for a program called What the World Thinks of God. And in the middle, there was a, a chair with a kind of, you know, one of those revolving chairs, and he just sat on it, span round and said, I put it to you, Prime Minister. And I thought, okay, that may be the gene is with him. So I don't know. And we're all show offs though, aren't we? There's nothing, nothing, nothing commendable about it. I don't, I don't want to go all psychologist chair on you, but I, it did strike me that it might be interesting to see how you'd, you'd cope with the loss of your father. I interviewed Martin Amis in New York, in Brooklyn, as my first ever Telegraph interview many years ago. And he talked about the death of a parent and I don't know whether it was the death of both parents or one parent or just a father, but as the sort of, it's that last line of defense between you and mortality when that person goes. So you're, you're, you then become in the vanguard. I mean, did, did, yeah. it a, did it have a big impact on you other than obviously being very sad? It was a long time coming. He had Parkinson's. Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not always sure he had Parkinson's. I wonder if he might have had something called multiple system atrophy because it really took him out. But anyway, it was it, it took about two, two three years of, of really big suffering. So and it was so it was he, he said to me once because he's a mathematician, I think the graph is now pointing down. And and it was so methodical, this illness, the way it knocked out every bit of him and then killed him that that it was it was not. There was no twist. There was no drama in a way. But even so, I couldn't believe it when he died. And actually, the very, the, the, one of the very last things he, he asked was to my brother. He asked about the, um, he was a structural engineer, so he's fascinated with that bridge that went down in Genoa in Italy. So he wanted information on that, even on his deathbed. Um, and yeah, I remember he could barely, I mean, the last three days he was out of it. But when I went and talked to him in his ear and I told him he loved him, I loved him. He, he just stopped breathing for a sec because he was, tr you could hear it deep inside himself. He just wanted to stop to hear exactly what I was saying. He was a lovely man. He was, he was um, a bit of a professor brainstorm person. He was just in a world of prime numbers. That was his thing, mathematics, prime numbers. He was, ne he was the last person to want a nice car or a nice holiday or a nice house. He had no interest in status whatsoever. He just wanted to be nice to people. So he was, he's one of these people, you, there isn't a single bad story about him. I mean, one story I heard on, at his funeral for the first time was that he walked into work with a really big bruise on his head when it was snowing. And they said, what have you done? And he said, well, I wanted to see, because I can do the most perfect, you could do a brilliant impression of your own dad. I wanted to see whether I could navigate my way across the playing fields with my eyes closed <laughs> in the snow. And I knew because it was snowing, I'd be able to see the tracks. And I hit the goalpost. And then he looks back and his tracks are just going round and figures away. And then it hits the goalpost and has a big bump on his head. I mean, he's just, that's, that, that's my dad, bless him. And my, I'd say he's probably, well, my brother's best friend as well. He was so supportive because he understood that if your son wants to do comedy, you've just got to wave him off to all these crazy gigs. In the early days, he would just wave him and he would just say, um, look them in the eye and pretend they all owe you money. <laughs> so he, was, he never had the thought that this isn't really a way to earn a living or anything silly like that. He just encouraged it. So he's a, he was a beautiful man. So no pressure then 
when you were growing up? No, not enough pressure, pro probably in a way. I think they're, they're very accepting, my parents. They're very Christian, though, so they would have had quite, quite and I've kind of drifted forwards and back and all kinds of kind of maneuvers around their faith because I found it a, a bit, it's so raw, it's forbidding for me. They had the perfect marriage and the perfect faith, you know, so that's really quite difficult. Um, they, yeah, they would have, I don't, I don't, I think, I don't think they ever really wanted us to do anything in particular, actually. I think they basically thought life's there to be lived, you know. My mum's still around. She's very lonely now without my dad. And, and this whole COVID thing means she's at home, aged 82, 81 and a half, she reminds me. And, and just, you know, that awful, I mean, in a way, you, you mentioned my dad dying and, and how do I feel? And the answer is that I'm glad he was spared this COVID chapter because to be ill and then have to defend yourself against this is no fun. So there, he did make a, a well-timed exit in a way. Did they nonetheless, even though they didn't apply pressure, did they sort of feel obviously proud of you? Did that give you pleasure, seeing your mum and dad excited for your progress? It made me feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes, actually. You know, yeah, yes, in later years, maybe, I, I've, I just felt pleased that I, if I'd given them some pleasure by, you know, they turn on the news and I'm there. When I was a teenager, I did not, I, I, I recognise the feeling now because I've got teenage daughters. I didn't want their approval to, to basically be a, a land grab on any, anything I was doing. So, uh, you know, you deliberately do stuff they won't approve of. Now, my dad was just too chilled really to to bother being disapproving of anything my mum was was more a little bit more formidable in not liking certain things and i would say i, I mean i'm i'm almost hoping she doesn't see this when i say that but but she, you know the, there was a massive gap between people born in 1965 and their parents a generational gap bigger than it is now i mean for me now my daughters say they're into taylor swift or now it would be billy eilish i can get billy eilish on spotify and i'm with it as well right which is a disaster for me in 1977 age 12 i become fascinated by this incident on bill grundy's show do you remember that london weekend show where i was in london weekend i caught they had the six sex pistols on and he says go on swear a bit and they and they just say excuse my language, you effing rotter, you effing dirty perv, or something on the air. And the whole ceiling fell in, you know? And, and for me, it's like, oh my goodness, real life has appeared on television. And for my parents, it's just, it's like the world is ending. It's the most shocking thing. So I think that cultural thing where the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 77, before you, you won't remember this, but the, it, was, uh, it coincided with the Sex Pistols' first album. And basically you were either supporting the Queen or you were supporting the Sex Pistols and that was the dividing line. And so I think it was very difficult for my parents, my mum particularly, to choose their battles and to stay out of stuff that didn't matter. Because in the end, if, you're, if your son likes listening to very, very loud music in his bedroom, that's fine. But it was, it was very much a turn that racket down childhood, you know, in that sense. I don't know whether this is a, a, a difficult question for you to, to answer possibly for reasons of modesty, but, or, or maybe because you're so well placed to answer it, you, you'll give it a go anyway. But it's, it's not that unusual for siblings to be very successful, both of them, sometimes even three of them. You see it in sports a lot. What, what do you think it is that about you guys or about your family or the, 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 the sex rub off? I mean, how, how, how is it that Tim became such a successful comedian you became such a successful broadcaster i don't know as much about your sister but i'm sure she's hugely successful in what she does but just thinking about you and tim together what do you think that is because it, it's something that we see repeated well it's, it's interesting you say because i interviewed R R richard osman the other day and i did not know that his yeah. brother you'll know this is the bass player in suede so that does stack your theory up but it, it's it doesn't seem like a coincidence if you well, know think of the so. snows jeremy think of the snows in your life yeah well think of the dimblebees of course yeah, the Dimble Biz is probably different because I think that's more of a heritage thing. But uh, I, I think we, we're both, obviously, same genetic material. So we're, the, let's say the three kids are show-offs. And then we happen to be in a world where showing off suddenly is, is something you can make a living by. I don't know. I, I honestly, I really have no idea. But I, it's certainly not talent, that's for sure. It's, with the BBC, it's basically, if you can hear an alarm clock, you've got a chance, you know. Connected question. Are you competitive as a person? 
Just not so much now because I'm here. I am at home, and I've and my penny farthing is right here, and my wife is not in, but my one of my daughters is here, and I'm thinking. I do uh, sometimes think, okay, you can now stop flaying yourself. You can actually stop running around, you know, to try and do stuff and prove whatever it is you're trying to prove. So, but yes, back in the day, and I would never admit it. I remember at Westminster, the, the person in charge said, excuse me, Jeremy, do you not look at the rotor? You're not in today, you're in tomorrow. I said, no, I don't look at the rotor because I come in every day. And she just said, right, okay, we've never actually had that before, but I suppose if you want to come in every day, that's fine. <laughs> the trouble is I was married at the time and I, then I wasn't married to that person anymore. So I, that was not particularly, hmm. that's like the two-two and the working on the student newspaper choice, isn't it? You know, there's only so many hours in the day. So if we look back and try and understand a little bit better how you got to where you got to, and then uh, there's so much contemporary stuff to talk about, of course, but I'm fascinated by your biography, partly because I'm in your world and partly because I just think it's interesting knowing how people that we're very familiar with who are on our screens or on our radios, how they did develop in their careers. And you, after university, did you go to the, the Coventry Telegraph newspaper? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Huge, huge moment in my life incredibly I graduated into a boom so this is now unthinkable but in 1986 these regional newspapers had scores of journalists and were crying out for trainees so I somehow now I nearly didn't get the job because I remember there was a when I went for the interview in Coventry a I'd never been to the city before and B during the interview there was a fire bell went off and we had to all leave the building and I took it as an excuse to go shopping I thought it was gonna be several hours when I came back, they said, where the hell did you go? It was only 10 minutes, you know, and I had to think very quickly. So I said, I was trying to investigate the source of the fire. And they gave me a job, incredibly, I hadn't been to Coventry before. And for me, it was incredible to be one of three trainees in a newspaper, manual typewriters, um, pen and ink, bits of paper you spike on a spike and then you give one to the sub editor and then he whooshes it around the building on a suction tube, no computers. Um, and it was like an adventure just beginning. We now know, of course, very sadly, that, that the, the, you know, the, the brightest moment is just before dusk or whatever, because actually the golden age of newspapers was just before the lights went out. The, you know, with all respect to the, those that are continuing and doing a great job, and I love newspapers so much, I love the printed work. But um, yeah, Coventry was massive. I mean, I, I don't think I've, because I'm realizing now it's such a precious experience that I had for a year and a half to sit in an office with 84 other journalists, bashing out stories, three editions a day, printed on the premises, sold all around the city, selling 80 to 100,000 copies a day, imagine, which is more than some national newspapers now. It's incredible. And it, it was such a route for people, wasn't it, earlier? I think of Adam Rusper, Joe, who edited The Guardian for 20 years. He started for three years on the Cambridge Evening News. You then, as you, we've already said, in the late 80s, 87, you, you joined the BBC. Not, it didn't take you too long to get into the Today programme where you were a reporter. And you're working your way up, working your way through, doing interesting stuff. But also, I've discovered, you were a, an author already by that stage. I mean, the early 1990s, well, yeah, I had a, light novels. I did have a couple of light, yeah, light comic novels about the Church of England that I wrote in my in my twenties because I've always wanted to write. So I'm always writing something. I mean, I've written lots of things that you know never see the light of day. So yes, I did have a couple of books out, but it wasn't. It was a bit of a Vicar of Dibley kind of uh, genre, I suppose, before the Vicar of Dibley existed. Um, no, maybe at about the same time actually. It must maybe it was more like that Derek Nemo program. I don't know. I mean, I, I've got them on my shelf, and I have this really weird thought: I must read my books sometime. I must read those books I wrote in my twenties. I've, I've, I've forgotten the whole thing. I don't know what they would have been like. But yeah, going on to the Today program. I mean, I was I was just very very lucky. I was a news trainee, and I kept sort of hustling. So I went into the Today office, and I said, "Look, I'm free on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Should I come and do a report for you or whatever?" And and then they said, "Well, you're not really because you're only you know." 22 or something so we, we it's not we can't take you on because of insurance <laughs> so i don't know whatever so i then said well what if i find a story so i was looking in all these magazines and there was a um an anti-fascist magazine called searchlight and it said that in carnaby street they were selling i mean this is incredible now they were selling nazi memorabilia in one of these tourist shops so you could buy these ss badges and iron crosses and all that and some pretty unsavory stuff so I borrowed a tape recorder and I went to interview the guy in Carnaby Street and, and he came and when he saw me with the microphone, he came out with a large piece of wood and started trying to attack me. And he was jabbing 
the actual tape recorder really annoyingly i could see he was trying to hit the pause button which was you know brilliant work by him because that would really kill it but I, I was shouting now he is trying to hit me with a piece of wood stop it and when i got back to the building they I, there was absolute lack of interest in the attack on me but they were furious that he tried to attack their tape recorder <laughs> and they put this report on the air and that was my first piece yes so that would have been 1988 yeah 23. you kind of came to most prominence or, or, or you sort of started to really make a, a name for yourself around the time of that 97 election didn't you? the famous tony Blair election well, that's kind of you to say so, because we felt we were all working underground there. Like, like in, they would just cover us in mushrooms and kind of occasionally throw water on us. Because it was, it was a very interesting little squad at, at Westminster. And again, I suppose I would now look back and think it wasn't very diverse. But you had John Sopel, his great Hugh friend Edwards. of mine. Hugh Edwards was there, Mark Mardell, Nick Robinson, Carolyn Quinn, Carol Walker was there, John Pinar was there, John Sargent was kind of leading it. Um, you know, it was a real Norman Smith was there actually, funny enough as well. He still only just left, and and I and I'm very proud to be part of that squad, which was put together by Tony Hall when he was the head of news, and and really we did feel like we were like the SAS. But for me, I've always found politics very glamorous. So I'm in a very very small minority here. So the first time, I mean, I'd done this job on the Today program, and I, after four years, I'd done the same, kept doing the same story again and again, which was do vitamins boost your child's intelligence. And I thought once I've done it three times, I've got to stop. And then I started looking around and basically, hilariously, I went down to Westminster and I said, I really want to work in politics. I love politics. And I spoke to it's Mark Mardell actually was there and he said, well, what are you talking about? I mean, there's, there's nothing going to happen for the next five years because John Major has just won in the 92 election. So he said, I mean, as far as we're concerned, Labour can't win again. So um, he won't thank me if he hears me quote say that because he'd probably tell me he didn't say that. But anyway, I, I, I thought, well, that's it. But we then had, and Mark and, and everyone wasn't to know, we had the Maastricht Treaty and then John Major's government just totally imploded. And then again, unforeseeably, John Smith died, the Labour leader, and Tony Blair came in. And, you know, that then we, it was just uh, rip roaring excitement really because because in the end you're employed by the story and then actually in 97 i then realized that there wasn't going to be any more politics and i was i was right about that because politics is what happens inside parties not between them and blair had total control control over labor for about eight years at least so i then became africa correspondent so i kind of got out but that period at westminster was amazing i mean there's just no end of news to be done you could come in every day and just be on every outlet it was fun. Yes, yeah, I'm sounding too excited by it, but for no, me, but it, it was just exciting. I, mean, I wouldn't say there was no politics because, of course, you had the TBGBs. Yeah, That's you did, but you know, to to actually try and get that on the air with no, I think it was Brown was so disciplined. He only really revealed how angry he was once in a breakfast news interview with Dermot Murnahan, where he said something about, well, if I'm not on the national executive, I'll have to change my child's nappies, and that was the only moment you saw a flash of the anger in eight years. So. But, but the 90s were, were, were chaos. I mean, I remember the, the brilliant, because um, just after 97, the Tories had to have a, a party conference after they'd lost the election by a massive landslide. And the party conference was insane. I mean, you had Alan Clark saying at, at a fringe event, the famous MP who wrote the diaries, so, you know, a simple way to solve the Ireland, Northern Ireland problem is just round up 6,000 people one night and shoot them. You wouldn't hear from them again. And then the Tories had to deny that was official policy. I was in the, the air, sort of one of these hotel areas where we were doing our outside broadcast in the morning. And Je I, I said, look, the problem is the Tory party's membership is now age, average age 68. And Jeff, I heard this booming voice half an hour later coming through reception. It was Jeffrey Archer. Where is he? I'll race him down the beach anytime. <laughs> so then I have to get, and you know, only about 30. Imagine what this is like. I have to go and buy it. They say, OK, you're going to have to do this. So I had to go and buy a gym outfit and go and stand on, on Bournemouth Beach waiting for Geoffrey Archer so I can race him the next day. You know? <laughs> I just think this is, this, is, this is the most fun you can have without laughing. Incredible fun. It's funny, so many blasts from the past. I remember actually going and listening to Alan Clark read out his diaries, his famous diaries. Wow. But you didn't hang around, Jeremy, because you, as you say, you went to go and become correspondent in Africa based in Joburg, but you, you, you covered some incredible stories there. The violence in Lesotho, I think, you went to Angola, you did the Eritrea, Ethiopia war. You interviewed Mugabe a couple of times. You, you kind of generated a bit of a reputation for being able to get the big interview. What on earth was it like to interview him? 
Oh, it was it was very strange, and I I think a number of people were. Uh, I'm not sure whether how many people say they did the last interview with him, but I don't. I think some of them interviewed him after me, but he was just at the moment where he was starting to think the BBC. I think he said Blair's cabinet was gay gangsters. He said, and the BBC was part of this cabal, you know, and and then he sort of shut down. But I was expecting an absolute monster, and we had a real. It was at the time, you know, the, th the funny thing about Zimbabwe when I was in Africa, which was post 97, so it's 98 to 2000, 2001, um, and it was an amazing time, was that nobody believed he would do this thing of seizing the farms. So we would keep interviewing the white farmers and they'd say, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. Just treat it calmly, it will go away. And then bang, he actually did it. And we, we interviewed him just when it was at, they were actually starting to seize the farms. And he was the most urbane, witty, shrewd, intelligent, interesting fellow. He was not what I expected. I gave him a difficult interview. I asked him about his family values when he had an affair with his second wife, you know, while his wife was dying. He, he managed to go with that. He, yes, he was not what I expected. I think very, very intelligent. But the problem for all these guys is that what happens is that they get worried about if they leave power, will they be thrown in jail? And that, that becomes, you know, in these startup democracies, like Zimbabwe is an example, he just, I think, became obsessed with staying out of jail and therefore staying in power. And the result was an absolute disaster. What do you think it teaches you, Jeremy, about human beings when you sit down face to face interviewing someone who has done monstrous things. I mean, I've, I've interviewed Trevor McDonald about interviewing Gaddafi, I think he's interviewed Saddam Hussein and others as well. Mm. You're, you're sitting there, and, and of course you're a journalist, and that's why you're there. But I'd be fascinated from a human point of view. Can you, can you see any good or humanity in someone who's capable of doing the sorts of things that Mugabe did? I suppose you've got to take everyone as you find them to some extent, but gradually you, as you sit there, you sort of process what you know about them from other sources and, and that gives you the context. But it's very difficult if someone is disarming not to be disarmed. You know, it really, really is difficult. I remember in the Coventry Evening Telegraph, this, this guy had committed the crime of having a sawn off shotgun in his, inside a ceiling in his garage. And, and, uh, and I was about to write, you know, convicted of sawn off shotgun and it's quite a serious thing. And then he came up to me after the case and said, sorry about that. It's all a misunderstanding. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Please give me a bit of good coverage. And because I was so, you know, wet behind the ears, I actually softened the article a bit. This is, you know, a century ago. But actually to me, you know, the Africa thing was not really about leaders and stuff. It was about seeing people who'd never seen a microphone before and going to a place where every single story was a scoop effectively because because no one had been there or you know you're, you're in if you see a tourist you know you're in the wrong place that's the, the first principle of any of those kind of jobs so you're going and seeing all the stuff that nobody ever wants to see uh, you know a lot of it upsetting and difficult an enormous amount of poverty an enormous you know the, the average i think someone said the average um length of you know, distance that a woman walks in Africa every day for, for water was five miles when I was there. Um, the, the, the life expectancy in Zimbabwe dropped to about 35 when I was there because of AIDS. So it was just so much misery. And I, and I really wanted to see, you know, hope and renaissance and all that. And then South Africa then swapped Tabo and Becky from, for Jacob Zuma. And there was a massive corruption. And I ended up feeling very sad about it. I don't want this question to sound trite, but how do you compare the experiences you had in really quite demanding environments, as you've just described, with what we are going through in this pandemic. Because for me as a journalist, this, this is, feels like the biggest story of my life. It's certainly, given that I haven't reported from war zones, the story that has absolutely impacted most on my life. You have been to war zones and you have been to places where, as you say, the life expectancy plummeted to 35. How do you compare those experiences with what we are going through at the moment? I think, I think the context is, is crucial. So you have to start by saying we have got a cushioning here in the West. We've got a, a welfare state. We've got a health service, thank God. We've got all kinds of things where if you've got a war breakout in Syria or whatever, you haven't got the basic building blocks. You haven't, you haven't got that. So it's, it's very different. And, and I, yeah, I wouldn't, in a way, I wouldn't want to compare it. I also think what you see, you, you know, it's often told, these stories are told through individual tragedies. And, we're, and the news 
is very good at doing that, but that can actually sometimes obscure the big picture. And if you just look, for example, at Congo and or Democratic Republic of Congo and the number of people, they say more than a million people have died in that war. And we've never had a single frame of footage. You know, we had about six seconds of footage of what the Rwandan genocide, which was obscured bizarrely by Mandela being inaugurated because all the reporters were in the wrong country. So I think those, you know, we, we hide that because we, how do we get a camera into those places and tell those stories? And the reason we accentuate our own suffering is because we're so wide for sound. You know, we, we've, we are giving our own commentary this, this on, endless ongoing commentary on our own pandemic, which, which really rams home how bad it is. Yes, it's terrible. It's, it, the eco economic damage is absolutely going to be horrendous, and that's going to last for the whole of our, the rest of our lives, clearly. Um, I don't think it compares to someone burning your house down. No, of course not. But the, the, the mental health implications for people, the, the implications of losing your job, what that does to, uh, to, to your life, to, to the lives of the, your loved ones for whom you're trying to put food on the table. You're absolutely right. Of course, we've got a cushion and we don't want to compare it. And also, we have to remember that there are countries in the world at the moment who are going through the pandemic who, who don't have a cushion for the pandemic itself. But, I mean, you say that we're going to be paying for this for the rest of our, our lives. I mean, we, we could be. And we're recording this late September, so things... I'm likely to have changed much by the time this goes out in the festival, but I mean, the impact, the economic impact that has yet fully to hit could, could be just crushing. I mean, already friends are telling me that they're losing their jobs. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, of course, because we have a society which it turns out is dependent on gatherings. Look at our event here. You know, gatherings employ people, gatherings are how we do stuff. We've, this working from home thing's fine, but you know, in the end, we do like to be in a big room. I mean, I, I do some after dinner speeches and stuff like that. So I'm not, it's, I, I've kept working through, through the crisis, I'm not complaining, but I see that end of things going. And I think of all the people I meet when I do them, whether it's the sound person or the woman who does the auto cue or, or you know, the producers or the people who put on the event. Or the, oh, yeah, so many, exactly and just nothing to do. And I think, you know, if we're gonna reconstruct our society to be pandemic proof, we're gonna to have to, how's it gonna work? You're never gonna be able to book a wedding again, you know, because you, because you will not know if it's gonna be wiped out. You're gonna to have to all, all kinds of new insurances. I don't know, I just, there, there's a part of me that thinks we should just, just basically try and walk through the fire actually and just, and, but then the, the, <laughs> The gatherings are knocked out anyway because people are so worried. You know, if, there, if Cheltenham put on a, a racing festival now, regardless of what the rules were, no one would go. So it wouldn't make them any money because people are so worried. So I don't know what the answer is. I just, like you, I think it's the biggest story since World War II. It's, it's, um, it's a particularly tricky customer, this virus, because it it's, spreads itself by virtue of most people not really being bothered about it. If you look at the statistics, 88% of people who've died in the UK are over the age of 65, and of the remaining 12%, 11% are over 45. So if you're under 45, you've got, you, you, you're fine. I've said to my kids, you basically, you, this is great for you. You're in a disaster movie where you can't die. So you've just got to watch all the adults panicking. It's absolutely fantastic. So I'm trying to counsel them to not worry about it. Um, but of course, that means it can spread. So I don't, I, I, it's, it's a, a really vexing one. You know, but I would actually, as a rider, I would say, I don't know where you were in 1985, when you might not have been born then. No, you were born. Um, but, but 85 was the AIDS crisis. That was bloody serious. Lest we forget, because I just read a book actually called And the Band Played On by Randy Schultz, who's a journalist who died from it, but who wrote, all did all the reporting of it in San Francisco. And by the time, anybody took an interest or the virologists started to look at it and they started testing they were about 10 years into it and they realized that they had probably a million cases and no cure and all of them were going to die and i think the aids pandemic killed about 30 million so uh, <laughs> I actually think that is worse, actually. I think that, I mean, it didn't bring our society to a halt because it was zeroed in so particularly on different groups, but it, that was brutal and incurable. Everyone who gets it dies and you don't know who's got it. I mean, that was very, very, very bad. And both of the diseases are so pernicious because one can kill you through the act of making love and the other can kill you through the act of breathing, the very act that keeps us alive. 
just, yeah. just want to ask you, is it, I should put a rider to what you said, and you may disagree, and a caveat, but it's not as simple as saying that, you know, you're fine if you're young, because this long-term COVID thing, this long-haul COVID that we've been hearing about, sounds pretty grim for those who get it. Uh, yeah, yes, that's true. But how many people have long term COVID? Because, of course, again, we're dealing with the media picking two or three people who've got it, um, just as the media have chosen two cases of people who've had it twice. Yeah, but I, I don't know how many. Number, but I mean, I'm not an expert. I, 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 I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I do. I agree with you. Long COVID, as it's called, is it doesn't sound good. And I don't. As as time goes on, I must say, I don't particularly want to get it. And my editor at Radio Two got it, and he was off work for six weeks. Now he is 62 years old. But it did properly knock him for six. So it's, it's worse than the flu. And it's very nasty if you're over 70. There's no question. I want to ask you more positively about how you've managed in the pandemic. Because you're still doing your Radio 2 show. You, you're still doing your Channel 5 show. I mean, that in it, itself is extraordinary. Because you come off air at around 11-ish or whatever. Because I think you pre-recorded a little bit of it. And then you presumably cycling like crazy and you're off to Radio 2 where you're, where you're on air at noon for two hours. And this is five days a week. There's no mucking around with a three day week or a four day week. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the only stressful thing for a broadcaster is not broadcasting. So it's fine with me. I, I, I love it. In fact, in, in some ways, the two shows work brilliantly off each other. By the time I come into Radio 2, I've had a really good session on channel five where we've got to cross everything and i sort of know where the heat is on the stories they've got very much the same genetic material i think if you listen to me on radio two and you watch me on channel five you'll see it's the same person it's not a different kind of performance for both i just feel very lucky to be working in the middle of this i, I think it's always a bit strange that journalists are described as key workers but because i know there are key workers who are far more key than we are but in the end we particularly on Channel 5, we managed to keep a show going out every single day in the depths of lockdown when we couldn't even have anyone in the studio. So they were all on screens. And that connection that, we, that we've got now is fine if it's two of us, but if it's four and they're trying to argue and they can't hear each other, it's really beastly for, for a host. But yeah, I know. I mean, so, so here I am at 55 and I hop on a bike as I did today and I cycle between Channel 5 and Radio 2 and it's great and I love it. And what's the problem? I, I found as a guest on your show, actually on Channel 5, doing it from home, that it just, it's harder to strike up a rapport with the other guest or to know when you're supposed to come back in or argue or, or, or do the opposite, just because you're not, I mean, you people get it. It's, it's not quite the same thing. Just, just, just on, this ish, on this thing of being busy, Jeremy, why is it that so often successful people are able to fit in so much? Like I think of Ian Dale, for example, former fellow presenter of mine at LBC, he's still there. And I mean, he just, he really just doesn't seem to stop. And nor do you. How do you find time to write a book like the one we started this conversation talking about? I don't. I, do, I feel there's, there's time. I mean, here we are chatting and I, you know, I don't feel like I'm pressed. Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's a great book called Parkinson's Law, which is all about work expanding to fill the time provided and, and how... I think the example they use is an elderly pensioner who wants to write a postcard and it takes her a whole morning because there's two hours finding a stamp and then two hours choosing the words where a business, they say businessman does it in four minutes. And I think that's, you know, that's, I guess, in the nature of it. I don't, I don't, I used to be more of a workaholic than I am now. I used to be really insatiable about, I've got to work because otherwise who am I? Now I'm feeling a little bit more that I, I'm okay. I sort of know who I am. And, and yeah, when I meet my friends in the BBC, you know, the presenters that I've grown up with, and we've now all my friends are now kind of famous presenters, and it's a strange thing. And we do have that conversation of this will end, and it could end badly. And when it does, we need to go out to a restaurant and have a, a bottle of wine and just laugh. Because whatever happens, we mustn't regret a day. When you say must end, you mean your careers? Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, look, sometimes things just... The surface tension on a public career now is so high. You know, you look at some of the ways that people have been cancelled and everything. And it, it just just don't tweet while drunk is the basic rule, I think. <laughs> just quickly on, on the Newsnight thing, because there's a sort of final piece of the jigsaw, really, in terms of your ascent in the broadcast world. And the question for me is, why, why did you leave Newsnight? I think I know the answer because I've sat in your BBC2 studio, Radio 2 studio, and seen the enormous amount of fun you were having. But I remember when you left in, I think, 2003, I remember feeling, and others felt as well, why is he leaving the best job in, in, in journalism? And it, it just felt like 
it felt very odd to me, and, and, and now it starts to make sense, but what was going through your mind at the time? Because you'd only been there for three, four years or so. And I, I was sitting there in the background as a 23-year-old, one, wanting one day, as I said, to be Paxman, and thinking, what's this man doing? I know, but when, when young people say, you know, what was your career advice? I always give them two conflicting pieces of advice. I always say, be very single-minded about what you want to do and be very, very flexible. And I think you, have to co you do have to constantly, slightly control out, delete on what you think you wanted to do. So for me, yes, Newsnight was a great show in the 80s and so on, and it was the pinnacle. Now there, it's still a great show, but there are a hundred other great shows. And I think my... Thing, what I really want to do and be able to do is to take news stories and talk about them to the people, the audiences in the BBC who are not served by Radio 3 and not served by Melvin Bragg or Newsnight or all the, you know, we know they get a, a lot, those people, they, they pay 157 quid a year and they get 600 pounds worth of programs. But actually it's people who live in, on council estates, if I can, you know, use shorthand or people who are underserved, who don't maybe watch the news they're the ones I really want to talk about the news with because I think that's where all the excitement is now. And I think that's, so I, I now feel really glad that I made that decision. But it, it would have seemed strange unless you'd been me. And, and it would, maybe I wouldn't have left if my name hadn't been Jeremy. But remember at the time, you know, Paxton was the God and I was the other Jeremy and it was a really awkward position. And the BBC is a very odd place. I mean, I was simply walking past Radio 2 and the Shepherd's Crook came out and they pulled me in. Jimmy Young, bless him, was leaving, aged 83. He had, I think, thought that the managers only did heating and lighting. So he was absolutely shocked when one of them said, that's it, you're, you're finished, because he thought, it's not, you haven't even got the power to do that. Um, so it was all very uh, ugly. And, and I sort of fell into that chair. And I, the answer to your question is basically, I love it. I love it. And on news night, you can't play Kate Bush. <laughs> Can you just describe to us then how much fun you have in that Radio 2 station? Radio 2 studio, why you love it so much and do you like me, and I've worked as a presenter in telly and also in radio, do you prefer radio as a medium? Because I love television, I love, when I made my own documentaries I love the creativity of the visual side of it, and I did miss that, that's why I went into photography and, and, and did all that on the side, but as a medium, broadcasting on LBC for those four years just recently stopped to get my sleep back, I mean there's almost nothing like it yeah, it's very, it's survived the internet avalanche. That's the first thing, radio. And amazingly that we call it the wireless and actually wireless means something else now, but it's amazing that it survived that and got even stronger. It's, it's great to be on a winning network. So I would say Radio 2 is probably winning more strongly than BBC 2, arguably. So that's, that's one thing. The medium itself is beautifully crafted for conversation and, and personality, actually. I think if you... If I, let's say when Terry Wogan was alive, if someone said to you, you're having dinner with Terry Wogan tonight, you'd think you know exactly who's coming to dinner. If they say you're having dinner with Hugh Edwards, you're, you're not sure. Because the guy, you see him, you know exactly what he looks like, but you don't know who he is really. And that's what radio does, it really colors you in. So there's that, and um, I suppose I feel TV is all about novelty. So TV is, you won't believe the new thing we've got. Look at this new program. Look at this new presenter. Radio is all about continuity. So the logic would tell you that you would have more chance of having a longer career in radio. And I suppose that that matters as well. And also you grow, you grow up with your audience. You know, I've now got people who say they were listening to me when they were children. I'm thinking, what, what the hell are you saying? But then I realized I've been there. Oh, I think it might be 17 years. I've got some quick fire questions because we're running out of time. Yeah. But before I ask you the quick fire question, what sort of shape do you think the BBC is in at the moment? Because I know you, it's a difficult question for you to ask because you, you work for them, but, and you've got to be careful with expressing views anyway, but, but, but because you work for them, but do you, feel, do you feel that it can sort of withstand the coming storm? Because television is in a terrible mess at the moment partly anyway, partly because of the virus. And the BBC is, as it always has done, but maybe particularly now, coming under a huge amount of external pressure and a huge amount of incoming fire. So how positive can you be about it? 
Well, there are a number of things going on. I don't agree that television's in a terrible mess because I think actually television's become very central to all this, particularly the news coverage. And goodness knows, if, you, if you're in the middle of a pandemic, you're going to watch a lot of box sets, you know, so there is that. Secondly, I think the BBC has versioned itself incredibly to deal with the new challenges of Amazon and Netflix. Because if you think the best dramas in the last year, you've got to go Line of Duty, BBC, Fleabag, BBC, um, Killing Eve, BBC, Bodyguard, BBC. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, I'm, I'm, as an employee of the place, I'm seriously wondering how they've, how they've done it. It's extraordinary. I mean, every single one is BBC. And also we're local. We've got a UK postcode, you know. So that's all the positive side. The difficult thing for us is that in the digital world, you're only really going to want to pay for the stuff you want to get. And the BBC's model is a beautiful thing, which is that you pay for this great blob of content and you're going to bump into things you didn't know you wanted. Lord Reith, the first director general, said we're going to give people something better than what they now think they like. And the problem is that it's very, very hard to sell that. Now, my show on Radio 2 is the classic example where you come in for Ken Bruce and you end up with my show and you stay for Steve Wright. And somehow we've given people two hours of current affairs on a, basically a pop station. That's the miracle of the BBC. You go in for one thing, you get something else. You go in for Strictly, you get Attenborough. But it's just, it's just that digital is so tailored and so precise. People are used to the idea that they, they're going to have a menu and they're not going to turn away stuff that they haven't ordered. And we, we've got to work out how we deal with that. And I don't know the answer. I mean, I think this is, this is the first hundred years has gone well. Let's see about the next hundred. So quick fire questions. Yeah. You're a multi-award winner. I mean, how, how many Sonys have you worn until you Oh, won? I did, really don't. I no, don't come know. on, hang on. Probably one. I don't know. No, I, yeah, don't... I think you won Speech Broadcaster of the Year twice. I think you won Interview of the Year once, and that was for the interview with Gordon Brown ahead of that famous election when, yeah. he, when he called the, the lady a bigoted woman and you played the clip to the poor man <laughs> over the radio and he, he, he had his head in his hands. Oh, I know, so, I know. Gosh, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, it was awful, yeah. So, so I'm just looking for a quick couple of career yeah. highlights. Best interview you've ever done apart from with me and also just, <laughs> just generally your best experience in broadcasting. Oh, you know, I'm so bad at these. I know, it's rubbish, but yeah. I, I want to get a sense of what makes you tick in that. What do you feel proud of? Uh, the best interviews are always ones with, with people who aren't famous. So in Africa, going to a place where Winnie Mandela was supposed to be speaking and ending up in a vegetable patch where in Umtata, in the middle of nowhere, where a village chief called Nicholas was hoeing his vegetables. And I said, look, Winnie Mandela is here. Are you offended that you weren't told? And he said, I cannot be offended because nothing has happened. I thought that's the moment of almost cosmic truth. And then the best moment in my career, probably right at the very beginning when I was on the Coventry Evening Telegraph, and I had to go and interview some students dressed as bears who were at the local railway. This is day one at the local railway station, raising money for the hospital, local hospital, the Waldegrave. And I, I had a notepad full of stuff. I asked for their names, their ages, their, I think I asked their heights, the, what made them do it, the hospital name, where it was, that's how much they'd raised, how much they were hoping to raise. And I come back to the office and the deputy news editor, Jeff Grimmer, says, why were they dressed as bears? And I said, I don't know. And then he sent me back down to ask them. And they didn't know either. So that I've always thought, why were they dressed as bears is the key question, you know. It's not very quick fire that, but, but that, is this because you're a storyteller? Would you say first and foremost you're a storyteller or is that a bit banal and a bit cliche? What was the second question, the quick quiet question? Let me try and do this one word answer. What was it? Was it best moment? Yeah, best, but no, but no, best, you don't have to re, you don't have to go back. I'm just saying as part of a new quick fire question, do you feel that, are you a storyteller at heart? Is that how yes. you identify? Yes. Yeah. And you wear your heart on your sleeve in, in, in many ways, your, your energy, your enthusiasm. I mean, look at the shirt that you're wearing at the moment. But are there things about Joe like that we don't know? Yeah, what don't we know? What don't we yeah, know? I, I do love poetry. Poetry? Yeah. I, I, could, poetry. I could tell when, when you did that, those couple of lines from my celebrity version of The Lady of Shalot at the beginning of lockdown, you said it with such, you recited the lines with such relish, with such gusto. <laughs> And I flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side, the curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalot. Yeah, but I always remember the politician Willie Whitelaw saying that no politician should ever be seen with a book. So I think I, I'm always very wary about saying I like poetry because I think it's, it's a quite a forbidding thing to say, but it makes me cry. It comes in so powerfully to me. I don't know what it is. 
drums as well. We talked about your musical history, but you, you told me earlier in the pandemic as well that you were sort of taking up the drums again. Yeah, well, have a look. If I lift this, you might even see that at the background. Can you see that? Just behind the side of my bed, yeah. I've actually got a drum kit there. And, that, and I've started learning to ride that bike as well. So yeah, I, I've, been, I've been doing, that's, I think that's instead of having a shed. I, that's my next, what I'd love to do is to have a shed. But I think at the moment, a drum kit and a penny farthing are the two things. And are you a good dad? Oh, I, I wouldn't want to answer that. All, all I can say is um, I, I just listen to the, the, the kids and they teach me stuff every day. I want to finish just by thanking you, but also saying, I mean, there's so much that we didn't cover, but we can do that another time. But th thanking you for your time, Jeremy. It's, it's exciting, this book. It, it reminds me when I was about eight years old and we were asked to do a creative piece of writing, write a short story, and the teacher said, think of the matchbox and then trace that match back to its origins in the Amazon rainforest. That's how you can tell a story. You can start from the particular and suddenly a world opens up. And that's kind of what you did with, with, with that Dali painting in Glasgow. You, and I, and I'm, I know that people will be excited to read this book because you have a fantastic way with words. It's the currency, as you say, that runs through all of your work. So I'm enormously grateful to you for joining us for this Harrogate Literature Festival event, Ray Wurst's Harrogate Literature Festival event. And I hope that you get to interview me again at some point in the future and make it <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt, so much. Thank you. Love you to talk.